before knowing that there is such a thing as the animus, I just was sure that I was one person who had all sorts of holy convictions, and which I felt were completely m my own. And also all sorts of, in my case, skeptical thoughts about uh, distrustful thoughts about human beings, about reality, about so on, of which I would have also said they are all really my own. And only when I entered analysis, I first recognized the animus in that form that I dreamt about negative men and positive men, and Jung pointed out to me that they personified, so to speak, these parts in me. And then I, for the first time, realizing this, seeing these personifications in the dream, I began to wonder if these different convictions and attitudes I had were really mine, or if I would wanted really to identify with them. And furthermore, I noticed that whenever I identified with certain of these attitudes, I got on the nerves of men, not only on Jung's nerves, but any man will do. Men automatically bristle, and that made me thoughtful. And then I... <laughs> That showed me then the two things together, that generally when I had identified with one of those personifications in my unconscious, who appeared personified in my dreams, then I got on men's nerves. And if you put that all together, then you see that is about empirically what the animus amounts to. That's why Jung says it is absolutely for a woman vitally important to have relationships to the other sex, for men to recognize the anima, because it's the simplest way of becoming aware that the men uh, are very friendly towards you and open and has a nice conversation and suddenly they close up and bristle. And then you must always ask yourself, now, now what's wrong there? Am I not quite myself in that moment? Now it can be that one has also an insight or a conviction or an attitude, or one is sure one, one ought or wants to do something, and the men bristle, and it is not the animus. Because naturally men do not only dislike the animus in a woman, but sometimes also for certain reason, unknown reasons dislike something of her genuine nature. But it is not so frequent, but it can happen. I've often seen in, in, when analyzing a woman that sometimes she had her true, she expressed to her husband her true inner self, her feminine self, and in spite of it, he, having learned psychology, say, oh, you are in the animus and so on, when it wasn't. So there one can only recur to one's dreams in such cases, then the dreams confirmed to the woman that she was on the right track and her husband, for some unknown reasons, was rejecting, out of personal complexes, was rejecting whatever she wanted to do or said or did. But even then, the great danger is that if in such a situation one then gets into the animus, in other way, one gets argumentative and wants to prove one's point, and wants to press one's point. And I would say whenever I recognize myself being in the animus, A, when I get on men's nerves, secondly, when I can't let a theme go, when I kind of possess, when I can't uh, say, well, let's agree to differ, let's drop the discussion, never mind, when I kind of get hooked into having to argue the truth out. That is always a, a symptom of the anim uh, being possessed by the animus. Now, you must think also that the animus being, that is describing more the negative aspect of the animus, but the positive aspect is also there, and then it is the invitation from the unconscious to, from time to time, act like a man, which can, for a woman, be uh, sometimes of very great help. I remember that when I wanted to buy a bit of land and had very little money, I had to give my last money to buy this, this bit of land. And so after having made the contract and everything ready, I just got the jitters. And I began to imagine I'm not insured, if I now get ill, if I can't earn, then I'm bankrupt, and you know the whole, as one does in sleepless nights. And in that night, I dreamt that I was standing on the high mountains of the valleys on one side of the Valis Valley, and which is a, about 200 kilometers broad. And from the other side, from the Mont Blanc side, I saw a black speck coming through the air. And I looked at it and thought, is that a bird? It's rather big for a bird. And then it came closer and closer. And when it came, after about 10 minutes, I began to see that it was a, a skier. 
a skier who jumped, who jumped 200 kilometers over the whole valley. So he would have won in Sapporo. And when he came closer, he came through the air and just landed beside me with an elegant Christiania. And I looked at him in admiration and, and said, oh my God, how do you do that? And there I saw he was a simple peasant boy who grinned at me in a friendly manner and said, quite simple, shut your eyes and jump. <laughs> Now you see, I took the hint, and I said to myself, shut your eyes and jump, and just sign the contract, though I was shivering in my boots. Now there, I let the animus be possessing me. I mean, it was an animus act, but I let it possess me because I thought this was a positive figure of me, and he was compensating my feminine tendency to be anxious and afraid. And therefore, I accepted the suggestion. So you see, the animus can uh, give a woman very positive qualities. We mustn't think of the animus as something ne only negative. One can, uh, it gives one the courage to do things that one's feminine nature trembles to do. But it is again a question, as it was touched this morning, to discern the spirit, who is who, and to have it out with these inner figures and to make up your mind. I made up my mind uh, quite consciously, now I'm going to follow this peasant boy because I felt he was something in me which had this kind of blind nature colored courage. And I felt this from looking at the figure in the dream, he was a kind of healthy peasant. And so I said yes to him and incorporated him. That was still animus, but that is the problem with the animus. But we should never be identical. We should always know it is a part within oneself and then morally decide yes or no and shall I let it act through me or realize itself through me or shall I in certain other situations say no and this is too much. I understood the dream naturally uh, mainly as a compensation that I was in this moment in a way negatively too feminine, too dependent, anxious, not courageous enough to take a lonely step. The feminine movement, if run by the animus, is destroying femininity. And unfortunately, there is quite a lot of that, that animus-possessed women lead feminist movement. And by that, destroy the very purpose for which they fight. They destroy their own aim. While if women would do it in their truly feminine way, I think they, they wouldn't need so much movement. They could just sit. <laughs> <laughs> and have a tremendous effect by sitting. <laughs> you can see the brutality of our race springs more from a lack of differentiation of the anima in men, that men have not differentiated their anima, and if a man has not differentiated his anima, he's liable to terrific outbursts of affect. You know, everything is cold and reasonable, and suddenly, bah, comes the affect. If a man reacts like that, it means his anima is, is not worked out. In a woman, it's the other way around. If she has not worked out her animus, then in spite of being feminine and uh, by nature not aggressive, perhaps, she will suddenly turn out an aggressive animus and then be worse than a man, than a brutal man. Women can be incredibly brutal. If you think of the Les Dames de la Halle in the French Revolution, the famous tricoteuse who sat there knitting, looking how all the aristocracy of France was going to be beheaded and enjoying the scene. I think that the non-acceptance of our own death and of the experience of the seeing dying people is a neurotic symptom which is, goes together with the whole neurosis of our civilization. It is a lack of instinct. The only thing which can help us to face death and to face the death of others are the instinctual reactions. I have had, unfortunately, to analyze quite a lot of People who were doomed to die had a severe cancer and uh, from the dreams there was no possibility to accept a miracle healing and uh, therefore the dreamer and I agreed on that now in about six months or a year this would be the end and sometimes quite younger people which is a very tragic thing and one of the most the process of individuation goes on in these people exactly as if death would not happen it just goes on in a rather greater pressure speed they mature faster and uh, death is practically in a lot of dreams ignored i saw only brutal death dreams in cases where the people hadn't yet accepted death and against all hope still hoped and by that wasted time then they had brutal dreams like their watch standing still 
their life tree being cut down. Just dreams we say, no, you must face the fact now that that's going to be the end. As soon as people knew, accepted the fact and faced it, then there was no more such dreams. But then on the contrary, one of the most frequent dreams I have seen in dying people with all the different individual other variations is that they should trust the animal. That a dog, their horse, their dog, some animal would lead them through the dark door. Which shows that we have, that nature has built in us an instinct. I think the instinct to live and the instinct to die is the same instinct. That same nature which carries us in the right way through life is that same nature which carries us on through the gates of death and we have to trust it. So it's only if we are clinging to our conscious views and not trusting the depth of our psyche that we are afraid of death. Naturally, the ego likes to live and makes a lot of antics and doesn't go. That also belongs. But deeper down, there is a slow stream which prefers for death. And there are sometimes before death, those people have such incredibly comforting and beautiful dreams that it takes away not the whole tragedy of death, but quite a bit of it. In one way you will die, but in another way that will be your psyche. You go on living and you will even feel better and good again and be cured and be able to go on. But your body is gone. If and when it is practiced in this way, that it simply means to stop this kind of activistic ego worrying and sit back and relax and take what comes, a transcendental meditation mirrors the very, very first step of active imagination. So to speak, the preconditions. Anger is given to us like claws and teeth to defend ourselves and is vitally important. We need rage and anger. But Jung taught us to first control it, learn to control it, and then to use it in a controlled way. That would mean to let it out, but he said to me, let it out, but so that you could stop any minute if you wanted to. And then you need it for self-defense, you need it as a means of self-expression, you need it even in therapy. He once told me, what do I do if a woman comes in and is completely in the animus and gets on my nerves? My conscious, the psychiatrist in me says, oh, the poor woman, she's now ag again possessed by the animus. What can I do? The primitive male in me says, oh, beat her over the head. <laughs> uh, then he says, I won't do either. But then I say to my shadow, now, that was okay. She needs a shock, but let me do it. And then instead of beating her over the head, he utters a disapproving growl, <laughs> which is not beating her and not accepting simply all loving acceptance. All loving acceptance is very destructive in therapy because it makes the other person unconscious and infantile. And some people don't, the penny doesn't drop till you growl at them or if you do this. They just don't listen. If you gently tell them about their faults, they say yes, yes, and nothing happens. <laughs> so then you have to use controlled anger. To give the other, that's why he said, I'm all for electroshock, but it shouldn't be done with apparatuses. I'll give it myself. <laughs> because then it remains human. When you do it with an apparatus, then it's inhuman. But if you do it warmly as a human being by just giving a warm animal growl, then, it, then it's also a shock, but it's human. So it is a very vital problem, as you see. A man's mother complex is, positive mother complex is an infinite gift of heaven. Look at Goethe. What would Goethe be without his mother? It makes creativity, it makes a man creative, it makes a man naturally liking and loving women, it makes a man artistic, it, all that. The disadvantage of it is that he becomes soft and easily undisciplined and that he can't stand hardships, that he can display the mannerism of a spoiled boy. And to help it, it simply means to learn discipline and to learn to not give up when things become disagreeable, to stick to one's gun, all that, to do a bit more training of independent masculinity. That's what it amounts to, to get free from the positive mother. Otherwise, the positive mother is like a beautiful cushion feather bed and one can become terribly lazy in it. So I would say even with that's one of the most outstanding negative features of a positive mother complex is softiness and laziness. 
friendly laziness. I think uh, psychiatry, at least for the time being, for a long time, will be different from what we are doing because the situation in the clinic and uh, the situation of over being overcrowded by heavy cases as psychiatrists uh, are exposed to in a clinic requires other means. If, if a psychiatrist would approach every patient as we do with personal concern and going deeply into his personal problems, which naturally would be a good thing to do, but if he did that, he would die within uh, three months. So, out of sheer practical reasons, it is not possible. One has to use psychopharmaca to keep the people quiet. These are all honest psychiatrists know this is a, not therapy, this is self-defense and tricks to cope somehow with an impossible situation. And I don't see, with the overpopulation and the overflooding of asylums, how that will be for a long time change. But I think it will be useful if in time psychiatry will learn learn more about what we do in therapy and then perhaps be able to pick out the more therapy capable patients first to spot out the more therapy capable patients among their patients spot them out and send them into therapy they would be relieved of those cases and secondly those cases would be capable of therapy and could be with good results treated they would still have enough of the other cases who are not so easily approachable for therapy. So I think it is a question of reasonable cooperation which should be built up. The unconscious is both, is demonic, is healing and destroying, is demonic and healing, is constructive and creative and utterly destructive. But we are the decisive factor. As Jung puts it so well, he says the unconscious shows us the face which we show it. And therefore, if we are negative to the unconscious, which is generally the case, or at least in the cases I have seen of outbreak of schizophrenia, the people were negatively tuned towards the unconscious because we are carried away by certain personal power or sex or other desires and wouldn't listen anymore to the inner voice. They were carried away by one drive. And then everything becomes negative. Then the influence of the unconscious becomes negative. And then even helps pay to pave the way to hell by negative synchronicities. And uh, therefore it is so tremendously important that one is not credulously just believing in the unconscious, but that one has to have a real confrontation with anything which comes from the unconscious. And that it all depends on our interpretation. The personal shadow is the personal shortcomings of things which every human being could be conscious of, which is not archetypal and therefore not a mystery. For instance, such things as greed for money or jealousy. Jealousy is one of the main aspects of the shadow or laziness, sloppiness, unrelatedness, sentimentality and whatnot. Inferiorities which everybody has but prefers not to know about. Mm -hmm. And because we generally strive through education and through environmental pressure to be a bit better than we actually are. Or we have our own ideals. I oughtn't to be jealous. I oughtn't to have a power complex. And, but you see, for instance, that in criminals, they sometimes live their inferiority and then they have a personal shadow which is noble. They dream about noble people and it's just reversed. They live, so to speak, their mean side and, and then they have a positive shadow. And therefore, even in a, what is more the average truth, the, the inferior shadow is not really bad. It's just human, all too human. And something one could know about. If one is jealous or if one is suddenly possessed by wanting money or so on, one could know about it if one is honest with oneself. But the collective shadow has to do with the dark side of the archetype of the self. That means it's the shadow of the God image. In the Christian tradition it would be the devil. And that has always been personified and felt as something which has not to do with directly with the human being. I mean, if somebody is possessed by the devil, he's much worse than just... He's not human, it's demonic. And but on the other hand, generally that merges. First you have this area of dim, dark side, and behind it 
lacks the other. I've, for instance, seen that when Germany went to the devil in Nazism, people fell into it through their personal shadow. For instance, they didn't want to lose their job because they were clinging to money. That was their personal shadow. But then they joined in with the Nazi movement for that reason and did much worse things than they would have done normally under normal social conditions. So you can say the personal shadow is the bridge to the collective shadow or the open door to the collective shadow. But the collective shadow comes up in those terrible mass psychoses. Well, now, if a person becomes more aware of then the he, personal shadow... Then that's why it's so tremendously important, because then you don't fall into the collective shadow. It's like if you have your, a room and there's one door not shut, and mm -hmm. there the devil can come in. Mm -hmm. And if you know your personal shadow, you can shut all the doors. Mm -hmm. So, for and example... And then you don't join in into mm. massacres and holocausts and such... You catch yourself and you, you can catch stop. yourself and you realize mm -hmm. and you can keep out of it mm -hmm. and keep reasonable, keep your head. While the, the average person who has, doesn't know about her, her personal shadow, they get swept away by the collective evil. The average American has a typical shadow and the average Swiss has a typical shadow, which mm -hmm. is slightly different. But there again, you can say the more individuals in a nation know about their shadow, the the better that nation is off, or less l likely to fall into a mass psychotic, destructive, sweeping away movement where people lose every measure, you know, I mean, just kill their relatives, kill thousands of people without even having a bad conscience about it. This real, just madness. You know, the, to see one's own shadow is such a painful thing that you will never do it honestly in a group. You mm -hmm. can't admit such painful little secrets. So all the official confessions people make in groups, oh, I'm jealous, or I'm childish, are just words. They cover up when it comes to the really painful spots. Even the analyst has to be very tactful and, and very treading on dangerous ground and looking out of the window and, you know, because it's the other is wincing under his realization of his inferiority. Mm -hmm. And so he needs a man to human being to human being situation to help the other to become aware of his shadow. Mm -hmm. And you can't do it in a big sweep. That it's is the so individual important. connection which is decisive. Uh -huh. Because you can't stand your shadow when you are alone, you just collapse. Uh -huh. You need a human being to hold your hand when you go uh -huh. into that dangerous area. Uh -huh. And if there's a group, you slide out, kind of. You, you slide out or you make gender. You know, like in the Oxford groups, everybody said, I'm greedy of money, I drink too much. Uh -huh. And they didn't mean it. Mm -hmm. It's in the personal relationship that it becomes so awkward. And then you are pinpointed, and then it becomes an indelible shock to see your own shadow. And then, then you have it, then you really know it. You can't forget it again the next morning. All close relationships are, in a way, analytical relationships. It, it is a, an, because it simply means a relationship in which both partners try to become conscious by exchanging each o with, with each other, sharing each other's fate. They are running from either from the shadow or very often from animus and anima. That's the big complication between the sexes. If you live with somebody of the same sex, it's the shadow gets constellated. If you live with somebody of the other sex, then the bigger task comes. That's why it's the more valuable relationship, because it's the, also the bigger task, because that constellates anima and animus. And as the average American nowadays doesn't know yet what that is, Whenever animus and anima clash, they run apart, it's finished, they throw it over. If they stuck it out, they would learn a lot about themselves. That doesn't mean that we are not sometimes for divorce. There are situations you better think of a divorce. There are relationships where both partners become destructive to each other, mm -hmm. plainly destructive. And then it is better to, to make a, a final decision. But there are others where it's just a clash of animus and anima, and if they could become conscious, they could get on again.